You're all right. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. Listen, I don't even know if we're actually on, so I'm just going to talk like we are on. Uh, maybe, Chris, are we live? We're live! We're good. So that's good. That And just pretend that that was a really professional way of starting this book launch party. Thanks so much for coming. I've never had a book launch before. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm an author now. Suck it. Uh, is that what authors do? I think they should be a lot more aggressive. Because I think once you've written a book, you can be artsy. So here's my book. Suck on it. Um, listen, thanks so much for joining me here in this very small corner of my uh, living room. This is uh, right here. This is dead dog corner. Uh, there's some pictures of dogs that I've known uh, who have died. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go back to them and see if the numbers go up uh, on dead dog corner as the, the, uh, the hour goes by. You'll also probably see uh, right now, you'll see a, a number. Where is it? I can't figure. Is it here? I'm going to guess it's here. Uh, books remaining. Look, 31. We didn't know that. Do you know how many copies we got printed? A million. And the whole joke of tonight was going to be that there'll be a vast number and it will look like we've sold no copies whatsoever. And that would that was our one joke, our one fucking joke. And uh, due to uh, uh, an error, uh, that joke can no longer be with us. Uh, so thanks very much to anyone who bought the book. Um, uh, we're down to 31 copies. How exciting. It is very exciting. It's very exciting for me uh, to be uh, here in this Zoom meeting with you because it's like the old days all over again, isn't it? I, I don't know about you. I fucking miss lockdown so much. And this, this is the reminder of how brilliant lockdown was. I'm doing a gig and I don't need to leave my house. Remember lockdown? We had all those months of doing fuck all and it's brilliant. Lockdown was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, right? I love lockdown one, lockdown two. It was the greatest trilogy ever made. Fuck Toy Story. You're absolutely right. Uh, Toy Story, of course, was a quadrilogy. I did really fuck that up. Uh, so apologies for that. But um, I want to, if, if it's okay, as we are getting nostalgic, um, I would like to uh, get, uh, get nostalgic about lockdown. Who who remembers lockdown? I can't see any of your uh, messages that you're typing into YouTube. So I'm going to imagine you've all gone, yay, like that, like an audience would. So who remembers lockdown? Type, 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 type. Uh, who remembers, seriously, do you remember when all the pubs closed? Do you remember when the pubs reopened? Who was there day one at 11 a.m. when the pubs reopened? I was there. I was fucking there at day one at 11 a.m. Of course I fucking was. Why? Why was I there at day one at 11 a.m. even though all my friends were gone? Are you sure you want to be doing this, Michael? I mean, it might be dangerous. Fuck danger. Why was I there? Because I am a British person. I don't want to be. I'm from Northern Ireland. You made me be British, but there we go. I was there day one at 11 a.m. My friends were warning me. I said, fuck it, I'm going to the pub. Fuck it, I'm not even just going to the pub. I'm going on pub crawl, yeah? I went to the Lamb and Flag, the Dog and Duck, the King's Head, the hospital, the isolation unit, the morgue. It was a fucking good British night out. Uh, I don't know how well uh, this is going down, so... Um, I'm going to imagine some of your faces. Uh, I can see Paul Litchfield's face. Oh, by the way, I have a guest coming up, Paul Litchfield. So, Paul, if you could do a face for me that approximates what you think the audience might be like. Yeah, yeah, Paul's... I don't know if you can see this. Paul's giving me that. And that's exactly what I thought as well. So that that's... It, already, it feels like um, most of the audiences I've performed to. Who remember? Who remembers lockdown? Who remembers... Who remembers when we couldn't buy any toilet roll? Do you remember? Do you remember, Paul, when we could wipe our arseholes? Who remembers when you had to scoop it out with a cup? Yeah? Who remembers walking around with a shitty cup? You, yeah, you're absolutely right. Sometimes that was the only way that you could absolutely guarantee people would keep two metres away from you. You're absolutely right. <laughs> who, who here, who here remembers lockdown? I'm just going to do this. 
just dreaming that you're staring at me. Who here remembers lockdown? Who here remembers washing your hands? Fuck off telling me to wash my hands. What am I, 30? We couldn't wash our hands though, could we? No. Oh my God, national disaster. We ran out of hand gel, but don't worry because celebrities, real celebrities, went on to the likes of the telly and uh, YouTube and CFAX. I haven't kept up with all the things. Uh, TikTok, I don't know what, I don't know what that is. Right, so they all went on CFAX and they told us how to make our own hand gel. And I mean proper celebrities. Actual real celebrities who have a proper job went on to CFAX and they told us how to make our own hand gel. Hollywood celebrities like, you know, uh, like The Rock and Glory Honeyford. Um, <laughs> and they went on. And they were like, hey, I'm going to show you how. I, I can't do Glory Honeyford. Um, I find it, the Northern Irish accent quite tricky. Uh, but there they were going, uh, I'm gonna show you how to make your own hand gel, yeah? You get uh, fairy liquid, uh, Lucozade, uh, turmeric, <laughs> caustic soda, gets rid of dirt, bacteria, your skin, the fucking lot. It's a good British hand gel. <laughs> Who remembers Disney Plus? Fuck. <laughs> Our lives were nothing before Disney Plus came along. We were trapped in a prison of our own and a disease's making during lockdown. <laughs> and we had nothing except <clears throat> we had nothing except COVID and Disney Plus. Disney Plus saved our lives. I got Disney Plus tonight, and you got Disney Plus, and you got Disney Plus, and you got Disney Plus, and you got Disney Plus. We all got Disney Plus, and then we remembered we're adults. We're adults who own every single Walt Disney cartoon ever made. That's right. <laughs> we live the lifestyle of a paedophile without doing any of the hard work. <laughs> now, yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't like that joke either. I, I hate it. It scares me. <laughs> I should be cancelled. Now, who? Ha, ha, anyway, the joke's on you. The joke's on you, uh, people who are going to cancel me for doing that joke. Because I didn't. I didn't get Disney+. Plus. No, I did not get Disney+. Plus. Huh? I made my own Disney Plus. Of course I did. I had a fairy liquid, Lucozade, turmeric, soup, and Pornhub. It's a good British night in. <laughs> Who knows if stand up um, doing, uh, doing stand up alone in a room really works. Of all people who should know that, I like to think it would be me. Anyway, thanks for coming. This is the official Strawberries to Pigs book launch. Uh, I hope that you have bought a copy and you've all brought yours with you and we're all going to read along together. Um, <laughs> uh, so sometimes I'm going to stop reading and if you could just take over, that would be absolutely fantastic. I am going to read some parts of the book. Uh, by the way, we're fucking down to 22 copies. And I'm telling you this now. If we sell those 22 copies before the end of this, this laptop's closing. I'm fucking off. Once they're gone, what? I don't need you anymore. Why would I waste my fucking time? But I'm telling you this now. Once it gets to zero, and I mean this, people who have bought their copies, we will need you to send them back. So, uh, I'm going to read something. Look at this. I've got... Uh, got an eyed pad uh i'm gonna read um i'm gonna read one thing from um from the book strawberries to pigs by the author michael leg i'll just have a sip of this alcoholic beverage god tastes like the ghost of fun um anyway um this is a chapter known as uh failing the drugs test this was a blog. I mean, a lot of the things in the book are blog posts that I wrote in my youth. Uh, a lot of them, but like when I was only like 48. Ah. And um, this one I wrote uh, and posted on Friday, the 1st of January, eh? New Year's Day, uh, 2010. Uh, and it gives you an idea uh, of what it's like to be a comedian and an arsehole. So... <laughs> Yeah. No, I know they're not, you know, sometimes they go hand in hand regularly, but uh, I think I think 
this is definitely the definite case where it, it is the case. So anyway, here we go. This is failing the drugs test is chapter four of strawberries to pigs. Here we go, everyone. And, you know, get your copies out and read along because this in many ways is our church. And I would like us all to read from our <laughs> hymn books. <laughs> This is so. I, I only want to do gigs like this from now on, where I guess. <laughs> you know what? This is the closest I think I'll come to being in a coma. This is surely what it must be like, where you're struggling, but you don't know if the outside world is reacting <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, here we go. Uh, now, here we go. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's, called fa- <clears throat> it's called Failing the Drug test. Great end to 2009 gigs last night in Reading. A lovely New Year's Eve show made all the lovelier with the presence of a bill full of great comedians who are also excellent company. We all had a few drinks together, laughed a lot, gave each other hugs and wished each other a happy and prosperous 2010. Then I left the venue and headed towards my final argument of the year. To be honest, I don't come out of this at all well. In fact, I come across as a nutter, a lunatic, a frothing psychopath in desperate need of electroshock therapy, or at the very least, I come across like a prefect. <laughs> I'd had a few beers. I'd had a few beers at the gig in Reading, not too many, but I'm trying to give myself an excuse for my behavior. Admittedly, it's a pathetic excuse, but it is absolutely all I've got. I got on a train to Twickenham to attend my friend's New Year's party by the Thames. Already, that sounds lovely, right? And half an hour into the journey, I smelled druggers. Yeah, there were druggers on the train, druggers, doing drugs. They were smoking drugs on the train. Not only is that illegal, it's also bloody criminal. It's unwarranted illicit, unconstitutional, and incredibly outlawed. It's unwarranted. Uh, I've already said that, fuck it. It's it's worth repeating. It's just so ruddy unauthorized. Anyway, I put my thesaurus down and I, as I am the trained dad, I got up to have a word with them. (laughs) But I, I, I can't emphasize enough that this, this happened to me. 21 books. (laughs) I knew nothing bad would happen when I got up to have a word with them. I knew nothing bad would happen because there were only two of them. They looked about 15 and they were very weedy in more ways than one. Anyway, um, they were sitting quite close. So I just stood up, leaned over and asked them to put out their marijuana doobie joints immediately. They looked at me, apologized and put out their blunts. Well, that was easy, and that was it. My last argument of 2009. Thanks, bye. No, hang on, because I've left something out. Oh yeah, me being an arsehole, let me continue. The drug children were incredibly polite and very apologetic. They wished me a happy new year and then got up from their seats and moved to another part of the carriage. It was part of the carriage that was near me, just as near as they'd been before. They lit up their 60s beatnik narcotics again. (laughs) Fuck's sake. I went over and the first words out of my mouth were, what did I say? That's what I fucking said, right? Christ, Michael, what is wrong with you? What gave me the right to say that to two 15 year old boys, (coughs) baby Jesus and beer? No, they apologized, but the arsehole within had already come out and I was on a roll. I took the mind trip reefer from the drugger's hand and threw it out the window. I fucking did that. And no one stopped me. I didn't stop me. Why didn't you stop me? <laughs> now already, okay, taking that joint and throwing it out the window, already that's mad. Why did I do that? Why have I gone mad? Why are their drugs affecting me and not them? I am tripping. I'm having a whitey. I've taken nothing but bad lager and yet the drugs have fully kicked in and I I am hallucinating. The drugs have made me believe that I'm not on a train and instead all I can see is an unjust world where I 
I'm the great leveler. It is I, and only I, who can make it beautiful again. <laughs> Did I? Did I say that out loud? No. No, I didn't. But I did say something. I said something. What was it? What did I say? That's it. I said, what did I say? Oh, fuck. And then I threw his joint out the window. This is mad. I am mad. I got madder. I told one of them to give me his phone. <laughs> he looked at me like I was insane. Insane? I'm not the one filling my head with that junk. I thought why the alcohol that is full of brain cell killing chemicals swirled in my blood. Why do you want my phone? He asked. How dare a zonked out drug hippie ask me a reasonable question like that? <laughs> I'm going to throw it out of the window. I replied with the measured reason of a mentally ill furious hemorrhaging swamp wolf. <laughs> A swamp wolf that couldn't handle his drugs, even when he wasn't taking any. <laughs> he just looked at me like he was worried about me. Like, like he pitied me. Well, fuck you, Pinko. <laughs> Pinko. 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 That's a funny word. I didn't tell him that I thought Pinko was a funny word. I'm not stupid. Instead, I just stared at his face or his reflection in the window beside him. I couldn't tell which. It's hot. I'm hot. I'm boiling. His look of pity is making me burn up. I'll ignore him. Yeah, he's not real. I'll just pick on his mellowed out bongo brother instead. I turned to his friend and realized that I had to show mature authority over these two wild hipsters that are headed straight for juvie. It's hot. <laughs> it's hot. I feel weird. I know I'm doing wrong. And the drugs have made me confused and suddenly scared. But I have to show authority. I have to say something strong, mature, and persuasive. What came out was, give me your shoe. The two boys talked me down from my terrible high by asking if I was okay in soft, <laughs> calming voices. Suddenly, I saw clearly that I was a middle-aged man on a train standing in front of two 15-year-old boys who were trying to be two 15-year-old boys. I felt embarrassed. My face was bright red and cold. I was actually cold with embarrassment. I reminded them that smoking on trains was illegal, not to mention rude. They apologized again and I returned to my seat and tried to hide in my coat and perhaps live in it forever. Like Kurt Cobain or Iggy Pop, I now have a drug story. I've really learned my lesson and will never ever stop anyone from taking drugs ever again. In fact, I vow to give drugs to everyone I see. They're a bit pricey, I know that. So maybe if I just give them the first lot for free, they can pay me for the next lot and so on. I don't mind. As long as I'm doing something good, I don't see the harm. And hopefully, hopefully, those two kids will just assume they had too many Benson and Hendrix and were just hallucinating <laughs> that they saw they saw the world's most embarrassing old man on a train. Maybe that's what will finally get them off that stuff, eh? Yeah, I really <laughs> am a very good citizen. Applause, 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 applause. There you go. That's, um, uh, how come the book's remaining number's gone up? That's weird. Anyway, uh, so that is, that is one, only one of many chapters from the... <coughs> Oh God, the weighty tome that is Strawberries to Pigs uh, by the author, Michael Lay. It's not just me here. No, you're here too. This is actually happening to you right now. We're gonna have a guest in a moment, but before that, 
We're going to have a commercial break. So we'll see you right back right here after these messages. I don't suppose you have a copy of Strawberries to Pigs by Michael Legg. Christ, no. It is rather shit. Fuck off. It's by Michael Legg. No. Strawberries to Pigs. No. Strike your head. Strawberries to Pigs. Always there for the nasty things in life like a block drain or a fat egg. At GoFasterStripe.com Oh, you do? That's wonderful. Uh, uh, can you read it to me? My name? Oh, yes. It's Strawberries to Pigs. Welcome back to the book launch. Uh, listen, hi. I'm <clears throat> I'm so excited about our guest here tonight. It's rare that he does. I mean, I don't think he's done a Zoom appearance in probably 20 yeah. years. Yeah. So it's incredible that we have him. Uh, people of the internet, if you could show your appreciation and your applause right now for the wonderful a fellow author, Alan Bennett. Hi, Alan. Am I on? Yes, you're on, mate. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it's lovely to see you again, Mike. <laughs> it's great. How, uh, how 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 did we meet? Uh, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry about the hat. It's just it it, it 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 it's painfully cold in the flat where I am, and I'm going for a Peaky Blinder strut Moby phase. Um, how did we meet? Well, we met, I believe, in two thousand and seven. If me mind is uh, normal. Um, uh, we were doing jury duty, wasn't that right? Of course, yes. Yes, that was. Well, a very you were. Old... I was. Uh, I was in the dock. Well, yeah, I. I wouldn't. I'm... <laughs> this is stand-up comedians. You never really know where you are with them, do you? You, you? You're a cheeky little bugger. You are. You really are. No, come on. We were both. We were both. Um, we were both doing jury duty for a, a rather interesting case. I thought it was. Um, a it was a celebrity case, wasn't it, Michael? Um, yeah. Which is something that um, you know you don't often. Um, so I was a quick go on me dandelion and burdock. Um, sure. Oh, that's right. That's wretched. Um, we were we were on, we were doing a court case where um, um, it was uh, Paul Hardcastle versus Chris Rea. I remember it oh, now. I remember yeah. it now to this day. Um, I mean that got, really got out of hand. It was a boundary issue essentially. Um, Paul Hardcastle wanted to build a um, arboretum um, in the shape of the Vietnamese girl in that pose, which is rather yeah. undignified, and that's what Chris thought. Um, and also he had a tannoy system in his garden playing na 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 19 uh, yeah. you know, all bloody night. Chris obviously had the uh, adjacent property. He doesn't use it normally, it's more of a summer retreat. And um, he was trying to write um, Road to Hell Part 53, and um, basically, <laughs> basically what happened was um, he got very annoyed with Paul Hardcastle and his um, Vietnamese girl, Arboretum, and the uh, music. In fact, he, uh, um, uh, uh, well, um, it became a boundary issue, essentially, almost like a bridal path, but, you know, let's not split hairs. And um, um, he, he, he rigged up his own tannoy system, um, uh, and he sort of rejigged or remixed, I believe is the word, um, Paul Hardcastle's Paul no, 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 19. But um, it... Um, his version was calling Paul Hardcastle a cook a cook a cunt, and um, that's when that's, that's when that that's when they came to blows, isn't it? And uh, I think we really bonded that day, or because we were the only two people in the jury that found them both guilty. Absolutely, and also we 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 actually took it one step further. We found the judge guilty, didn't we? Yeah, and, and everyone um, on earth, everyone on planet Earth, we also found guilty. And then I seem to remember we went to a lovely Weatherspoons and we burnt it to the ground. Yes, and that was lovely. And we were wasn't found it? guilty, and we were found innocent. Uh, I think, <laughs> um, as far as what I'm concerned. But Michael, Mr. Michael Legg, I have a question for you, if you don't mind, from Actual author to author. author. Yeah, I love. I got. I fucking love questions. Okay, well, my question is this: the title of your book, Strawberries to Pigs, 
How did that come about? Because it, it, it it's very Jacobean. It's very um, thank you fruity and flighty in its tone. It's beautiful in a way. It's strawberries to pigs. And the only reason why I ask is because I remember once I gave Ravita to a seahorse, and twelve hours later the Falklands War started. So yeah. I don't I, I don't I don't know if that's got anything to do with anything. No, it's um, exactly that's exactly where I got the name for the book from. From you giving Ravita to a seahorse. A seahorse. Yeah. I just misheard it. Right, that misheard the entire fucking thing. Oh, I thought, do you know what? If I can start Falklands too, I'm going to do it. Oh, Michael, don't. I mean, because because of you and your ilk, you know, you and your accursed oh, yeah, yeah. kind for where you live. My elk. Yeah, you and your elks. You yeah. you can't start fisticuffs at this stage in your life. Not with you and your uh, problems. I'm I'm not going to do any fisty, fisticuffs on Zoom. I've learned my lesson. Hey, Alan, um, you've got your diary with you. I do have an extract of a diary for you. I thought you know, it would be... I don't, I don't know if you know this. I was doing a bit of a reading from one of my books. It'd be great to have a reading from your personal diary. Oh, well, that's absolutely wonderful. I, I've actually chosen a diary entry from today's date, um, which, of course, is the 8th of November. Let's read the thing. 2021. Um, so I decided I would read you a diary entry, and I'm more than happy to do so. Um, this is taken from uh, November the 8th, 1984. Um, okay, here we go. Um, this does bring back quite a lot of wretched memories for me, but I will try my best to get through it. So um, here we go. <clears throat> November the 8th, 1984. Sometimes I have to stop dead in my tracks and ponder how bad luck can often find me, trip me up and then charge me for the inconvenience. I was at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridgeshire visiting Richard Attenborough, who was convalescing in a private room for treatment for chronic sciatica, a condition he developed after he'd fallen off the back of a tuk-tuk while scouting for film locations for the film Gandhi in Calcutta. His condition, like most back-related pain, had come and gone over the past two years, but had recently come back with renewed vigour, delaying a production of The World About Us that he was narrating about the blind devotion of the disciples of the god Shiva. We chatted a while about the usual comings and goings of our lives, and then suddenly we received another visitor, none other than the millionaire computer boffin, Sir Clive Sinclair, who, being a fellow resident of Cambridgeshire, had struck up friendship with Dickie during a charity bridge game for overweight guide dogs, where they both discovered their mutual passion for water mills <laughs> and river course management. After a pleasant conversation that occasionally strayed a little too often onto the merits of vertical or horizontal wheel and drag rotation, we said our goodbyes and Clive offered me a lift to Shelford Station, which was gladly accepted, actually, because the walk to the hospital on the route, had, I'd stumbled across a few examples of graffiti that lacked proper grammar and were technically libelous. I was on said journey when Clive waxed lyrical about a new project he was working on and asked if I would be interested in seeing a prototype. I mean, I agreed more out of politeness than curiosity and thought nothing of it until two weeks later when I was picked up by Clive's personal chauffeur, another man called Clive, actually, who spent most of the journey telling me the team fixture results of his beloved football team, Sheffield Wednesday, in forensic detail as we drove at considerable speed to an undisclosed location somewhere in the proximity of Merthyr Tidville in Wales. I was met by Sir Clive and his engineering team over a late lunch of potted shrimp and a slightly disappointing modern twist on what they call a Nordic gravelax before being blindfolded and ushered into a hangar that required voice security activation to enter its hallowed halls. It was here that Sir Clive revealed his new creation, an electric powered tricycle with a chassis designed by Lotus. To be honest, it looked like someone had bolted the wheels of a mobility scooter to a coffin, but I did my best to keep an open mind. It was called the Sinclair C5, as the C1 to the C4 models were not legally roadworthy and had been mercilessly criticised by endless lobbying from the unspoken mafia that were the top bicycle manufacturers. I was also informed that the Sinclair C4.1 was prone to bursting into flames every time the driver made a left turn. But this final model would revolutionise the way we all looked at transport. Clive then ushered everyone out of the building and invited me to take a test drive before asking me to fill in a waiver form, which I noticed was oddly printed in Comic Sans. I took it for a spin whilst Clive looked on wistfully like a tragic lover on the edge of a cliff staring out at sea, yearning for his beloved to return home. After I finished, he rather 
formally passed me two pieces of paper and asked me slightly curtly, if I'm being honest, to use each separate page to create a list of pros and cons. And he said he'd give me an exact hour to do this. I replied rather too hastily that five minutes would be more than enough, but he was gone, leaving me alone to weigh up my options. Suffice to say that he was not best pleased with my thoughts. I mean, <laughs> this possibly had something to do with the fact that the cons list dwarfed the pros list by seven to one. The pros being that it probably looked you know, probably look nice in an eggshell blue. And also there was enough room in a luggage hatch to keep a mid-sized satchel or a cordless foldless lamp. He was clearly incensed by the 14 bullet points that made up yours truly cons list and then fired back all the accusations at me like some evil angel conspiracy theorist stood in a milk crate on speaker's corner. Yes, he screamed, you would get wet when it rains, so you simply wear a fucking hat. Yes, it doesn't have a fucking reverse gear, but it can be picked up by the nose cone and fucking simply turned around. Yes, it couldn't cope with the steep gradients, so we'd do extremely fucking well in Norfolk. Well, I mean, after a painful minute of long and protracted silence, he just scrunched up my notes and then ate them. He then walked over to the far end of the large hangar, his footsteps echoing in the massive space as he made his awkward journey. He then took his dick out and urinated in the corner. <laughs> and then slowly walked back the way he came, hopped into his car, gave me the finger and attempted to make a dignified exit. The problem being, of course, that the vehicle was not facing the door, which meant I, Muggins here, had to gingerly pick him up and turn him around by the nose cone whilst avoiding any eye contact. I was soon left alone and took the opportunity to work out how long it would take me to get home on a Sinclair C5 allowing for 20 miles on a full charge, and then four hours to recharge. It was approximately 11 days. Moments later, the other Clive arrived and bustled me into the back of the private car. This time I wasn't driven home. I was driven to the local train station in Aberdeer with no small talk or a whiff of the decisions to declare a legal offside rule. I caught the train back to Paddington the next day after a charming mid-afternoon winkle picking on the beach. I received a letter a few days later from Mr Sinclair saying how disappointed he was in my lack of vision and that I would not be invited to the glitzy launch date in the new year. As a side note, he reminded me to be more open and aware to changes in life, like Ernie Wise, who just embraced the notion of the mobile telephone and was going to make the first ever UK civilian mobile phone call on New Year's Day via something called the Vodafone Network, whatever that is. He didn't mention he was calling. I can only hope it was common sense. Thank you very much. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Well, that, as that, always, that was a true story. That was a dreadful afternoon with Sir Clive. It really was. Who's the now? What's the biggest thing you've ever seen? Um, <laughs> as in, as in sheer size, sheer height, volume, ratio. Yeah. Um, I once um uh, shared a um, bunk bed with Bella Emberg. Right. And, and that, was the bunk bed be big or was Bella big? Bella was big. She did right. dwarf the bunk bed, but she was very comfortable and she let me snuggle in. Uh, classic Emberg. Classic Emberg, yes. Well. Absolutely. Hey, um, listen, sorry, can I can I take this shit? I can't, I just, I just, I mean, this isn't, that's uh, not, Do you know what? I'm really glad. This you, isn't you, fucking you, Alan Bennett, is it? Me. <laughs> Your fucking, <laughs> fucking voice. Listen, I'm sorry. I've torn down the fourth wall, Michael. I can't. No. Do you also, know I tear it down? I can't uh, find the wig I used to use, so I wore a hat. Listen, it's, I think it's more authentic with a hat. You do? No, well, only, only if Alan Bennett, the real Alan Bennett, starts wearing a hat. Then, yeah. Yeah, and doesn't yeah. sound like me and um, is 40 years old. You should older. sue the cunt. Do you know, I might sue Alan Bennett. Sue him for not looking anything like you how or acting like you or saying like you. Fucking like dare you. Fucking job harder. <laughs> anyway, listen. Congratulations on your book. Congratulations to you. You oh, are you. somewhat brilliant. Oh, and I really love you lots. So thanks. Hey, we've got questions from um from the internet. It's not oh. nice the internet of pop round. It's nice that they pop around, but I'm not answering any of those fucking questions. Oh, I'll be honest with you. I've looked at that. We've got maybe about 30 questions, and the answer to all of them is, yeah, fine. Oh, okay. All right. Including, um, 
Um, um, Salma Hayek. Including uh, Terence Trent Derby. Vegan steak knives. That's a question, isn't it? Vegan steak I don't, knives. I don't, I don't find that. No. Well, that's a question. So well, why is it? With thought. Oh, that's the question. It's not the person. No. Vegan that's steak knives. Um, also, um, I'm just saying this. Tracy Morgan has pointed out, uh, and now I'm slightly embarrassed, that um, the book remaining uh, numbers, it, it does make this automatically like QVC. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, as you know, uh, when, I live, <laughs> when I used to live with lovely Dan Mesh, we both used to religiously watch, um, it wasn't QVC, it was, um, I think it was called Bidop TV. Yeah. And the great thing about if you watch Bid Up TV at the right time, you could get the presenter seven hours, 45 minutes into their eight hour stint. So, you know, now oh. they're just their brain is just on fumes. They're just got there because they have to. Constantly... And you can buy them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm was... No, I'm che- wait till I'm cheaper. I'm trying to remember the guy who Dan and I used to be obsessed with. I remember one moment where he went, these watches are quality. They're made by Slazinger. And... <laughs> 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 yeah. But there was a bit he was trying to sell a mattress, I think. He was trying yeah. to sell a mattress, and at one point made by could... Britta. <laughs> made by Brit. You could you could just see his eyes have just they've gone, they've closed over. Yeah. And he just says something like, if you lay on that and you urinate, there'd be a rainbow. <laughs> and you were just like, What? Yeah, the he's gone. Fuck. Seven hours, 45 minutes to an eight hour shift. Oh. But you know what? That wouldn't, I mean, if that were true, God, you, you'd piss the bed every day, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, for a rainbow. As opposed to every other day, if you're me. Yeah. And it's, you know, never a rainbow. Great thing about you, Michael, is, is that you always shit next to the bed. And that's what I've always oh, yeah, admired yeah, yeah. about you. Yeah, I always keep Next a bag. to the bed. I always keep a paper bag right by the bed. <laughs> to pick the shit up in the morning. <laughs> yeah. So, how many chapters are in said book, Mr. Leg? Uh, I don't know, three. <laughs> There's more than three. Oh, fuck. I haven't read it. It's beneath me. Well, Chris, you haven't read it. Left, though. You don't read it. You write. You don't read. You write, sir. Yeah, exactly. I'm ready yet. And I tell you one thing if you do buy any of the remaining 15 copies, you'll see how little I've read it because uh, we picked up two more uh, spelling errors today. Oh, you, you keep, you keep finding three spelling errors so far mm. that I know of. Really? Did you find three M's in Himmler? Yes. <laughs> I mean, there's one page where it just says Hitler constantly. You, you don't call Paul pa- Paul Pan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Call him Bonnie Langford. I don't know why. <laughs> um, oh man. Um, who yeah. does who does that for for this sort of um? Th- who's your? Is it you? Do you have to do your own spell check? No. Here's the thing. Who uh, does it? It's the books come out on Go Faster Stripe. Buy it at gofasterstripe.com. But uh, what I do is I, I write it, then I send it to Faber. Uh, they read it and they go, Faber. God, we're, Faber, and they go, we're not publishing this. Hang on, ha ha. But you read it. You didn't say there was any spelling mistakes, and that's how we get it done free. <laughs> Very clever. That's very clever system. Very that got. clever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because that short film you did of you just crying in the park, you sent yeah. to you sent to Disney. Sent that to Disney Plus. They went yeah. no. Went ha ha. Yeah. All right then. Edit that then. Yeah. And they were like, oh, do we have to? Yes. <laughs> Read the yeah. small print. What? Put a load of CGI in that then, dickhead. <laughs> yeah. I. I sent them a video of me picking up shit from the side of my bed with a paper bag, and they went, we are not going to touch this. And I went, oh yeah, see if you can do better. And they made Avengers. So they didn't. So yeah. they didn't? Yeah, they couldn't do That's it. the punchline oh, to that man. Wow. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba, da. Are you going to be um, going on a book signing tour? Or it- No, this is it. This is literally all the publicity. Right. As soon as those 15 copies are gone, uh, I can sleep. Right, okay. You're not going to just stand outside your door screaming until those books are well, sold? I mean, look, a Bossman's holiday, mate. That is true. Bossman's what is holiday. going on at the end of your street? Because the end of your street over the last, what, how long have I known you? 20 odd years? Longer. <laughs> the end of your street is just like a fucking beautiful mystery <laughs> wrapped in an enigma. <laughs> at one moment, wasn't it like a school for the 
blind or the deaf or the mad or one of those and then became a prospective gypsy site. Yeah, a traveler's site, uh, yes. Traveler's site, site, sorry. And, and there's uh, now, it's now what? It's now what? And now it's, a, uh, as- in- now it's an asbestos farm. No, it's an asbestos farm. Yeah. It's now it's actually where they film all the new Scotland Yard material, weirdly. Yeah. Oh, did I tell you about there. the drug fridge? Yes, you told me about the drug fridge. This drug there's fridge a, is beautiful. There's a fridge in my street, a, di- a discarded <laughs> fridge in my street that no one, no one's going to touch because we have all, we've now, everyone in my street has seen a drug dealer come down the street in the middle of the night, open the fridge that is discarded just in the street, put drugs in the fridge, close the door and then walk away. 20 minutes later, a bloke comes down, <laughs> takes drugs out of the fridge and then walks away. It is, it is Ken Loach's Miami Vice. <laughs> and? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Paul, thank you so much for, um, well, thanks for everything, everything you've ever done. Hey. Every hey. shit you've had. <laughs> every... Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think we were all very happy but... to have you here uh, as our book launch party guest. Well, um, thank you so much for asking. I'm going to read one more part of the book, and then, uh, and then I'm just going to take my clothes off. And I'm going to stand here until everyone leaves. Wow. Well, I'm going nowhere. Really? Nope. So thanks to Paul Litchfield, everyone. And uh, we're going to take a commercial break. We'll be right back after this. What can I use to throttle someone who buys me Mike and Leg's new book? What can I throw at him? I want to sleep through the book. Do you have an alarm clock that doesn't work? Uh, is there any format that he won't be on? Is Michael Legg a better actor than he is an author? No. Okay, then just give me two things to shove up his ass. Strawberries to pit. You've got questions. You'll have a lot more once you've read it. Available now at gofasterstrike.com. Well, that was the past, and this, unfortunately, is everyone's future. Uh, didn't, didn't my hair look better when it was painted on all those years ago? And if anyone, anyone at all um, can bring my memory back so that I remember doing that Tandy advert, will you please not do that? I, I really like the fact that I have zero memory of that Tandy advert. We're going to read one more. Uh, not even going to read a chapter from the book. We're just going to read. Um, I'll be honest with you. I read this today and I I got angry with myself because I didn't put it in the book. And I made that choice not to put it in the book. It's not like I forgot it. I did look at it at the time. And I went, no, I'm not going to put that in. And then I read it today and went, oh, fuck's sake, Michael, you stupid, stupid boy. And, uh, and I didn't, this was the only day I didn't pick up the shit from the side of the bed. I went, no, you've been naughty. Keep the shit by the side of your bed. So I'm going to read a blog post. I'm going to give you a little bit of background to this blog post. It was written on Saturday, the 23rd of April, 2016. It was written, um, I think, the day after or maybe two days after... Um, Prince died. Uh, Prince is a pop star. He's very good. Um, if you don't know his music, uh, you should probably uh, seek him out. It's pretty good. It's been some good stuff. But here's the thing. Uh, on Twitter, a lot of people uh, quite rightly went, oh my God, Prince is dead. That's really bad. Uh, you know, everyone, he's one of the greatest um, uh, musical icons uh, of the 80s and 90s, I guess. And and uh, that. but that's fine. He's got every he, he he soared so high. He's allowed to anyway. Um, but um, some people, as you know, on Twitter, they they overshare if anything. And uh, one of those people um, was David Williams. I don't know if you know him, David Williams. Um, he's the guy that's in a load of comedy sketches, pretending to be black or or, or Asian, and 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 we and we don't know. 
what's funny about it. So uh, he's that guy. He's that guy. And he tweeted, thank you. Let's see if you can see. You probably can't. But the, the tweet is right there. There you go. Can you see that? Thanks so much. I can't read it because it's it's backwards now. Basically, um, yeah. Basically, he... Uh, that was his tribute to Prince. And I... I question that. So anyway, um, here is uh, a blog to, uh, to round up. What a party it's been. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty giddy and drunk. I wonder if there is a guy called Gideon Drunk, Paul. Do you think there's a guy called Gideon Drunk? And is he pretty? Anyway, uh, Paul's still here, but he's on mute, um, which is something I'm going to look into next time I bloody see him. <laughs> what a cunt. Anyway, here we go. This is a blog uh, called Arsehole, formerly known as David. Thanks. On Thursday, like so many of us, I put on my black armband and walked to the local florist. When the young woman who worked there asked if she could help, I wiped tears from my eyes and my throat cracked a lost yes. I wanted flowers, purple flowers. They had to be purple. I wanted beautiful purple flowers, roses, morning glory, lavender. And I wanted them arranged lovingly into the shape of a name. The name of someone I've admired for so long, more than I could ever admire anyone or love anyone. I wanted those flowers arranged into the name Michael Legg. When the young florist asked why I wanted flowers in the shape of my own name, I asked her to sit down because I had some terrible news. Prince is dead. She understood immediately. One of the world's greatest songwriters, musicians and showmen had died. And what else could I do but make it all about me? When I looked on the BBC website and read the news that Michael Legg's Prince had died, I just wanted to curl up into a ball and exploit him. I looked through my entire collection of Prince albums, uh, hits one and two, the best of Prince, and the very best of Prince, and tweeted about my favorite songs like uh, a normal person would do, you know, Purple Rain, Raspberry Beret, and Purple Rain to name just three, as well as rarer cuts like When Doves Cry. But it just felt pointless. A great man is dead and no one knows that I met him and we have a strong connection, even though I haven't and we don't. We all mourn in different ways and my way is to take the focus away from the deceased and put it directly on me. Through tears, I tweeted Tim Burton saying how sorry I was that he had lost the composer of the Batman soundtrack, making sure I put a full stop in front of his Twitter handle so everyone could see that I wrote, see what I wrote, and maybe think that I might know Tim Burton. I don't know Tim Burton. I don't even like him. But that's hardly the point. I am the point. Then I tweeted that, like print, I too don't eat meat, thereby, 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 my liver, thereby letting the world know that a torch had been passed from the dead rock star directly to me as I was alive and I would carry on his great work of eating some vegetables. Then I did the only thing that I could do when someone famous dies in your manipulative piece of shit. I wrote to Prince's estate asking if I could attend the funeral read out a memorial to him in front of the grieving about me, uh, take some selfies of me beside dead Prince, and then defecate into his open mouth. <laughs> they, they respectfully wrote back saying they understood how I felt. Michael Legg's Prince meant so much to so many people, and it was only natural to want to read a thing about yourself at his funeral take some fun pics of you and the corpse, and then to defecate into his mouth. It's completely normal. 
But sadly, so many other people had already insisted that they attend and shit in his mouth that they just couldn't make room for any more. Elton John, Kim Kardashian, uh, Emma, what's her name, Emma? Bunton. All right, let's say Emma Bunton. That's not who I meant. Uh, the name I've got down here is so dated, I've forgotten who they are. Emma Hitler. Emma Hitler. She's a bloody gossip. Anyway, so many people wanting to show their disrespect, their disrespects and vulture the remains of the dead for money, fame and Instagram. I am grateful to Prince's estate for their understanding and their promise of one of Prince's feet, if anything is left of him after the funeral. I'll Snapchat the foot as soon as it arrives. So please link to me, yeah? Is Snapchat still a thing? Uh, it'll be on CFAX. <laughs> Lots of people tweeted about Prince with respect, saying they love his music and what a great loss his passing is. And lots tweeted about themselves, just like I wanted to. But none of them came close to the same desperation and neediness that I felt since his death and all the opportunities it presented. I hope to find a kindred spirit, someone who loved exploiting the dead as much as I did. Thankfully, I met that kindred spirit. What helps us through the grieving process more than connecting with someone who feels as you do? I am so grateful then to David Williams for his deeply moving, thoughtful and manipulative tweet Thank you so much, at Brian Ferry, for inviting me to have dinner with hashtag Prince a few years ago. One of the most unforgettable nights of my life. One of, what a fucking piece of shit. That really happened in actual real life. And I thank him for it. I thank him for letting me know that he met Prince. I thank him for letting me know that he is friends with Brian Ferry. And I thank him for sharing with us all that it was one of the most unforgettable nights of his life, despite him forgetting to say what it made it so incredibly special. One can only dream of what uh, could have happened that lovely, unforgettable evening at Brian Ferry's Fox Free Mansion with Prince dining with those two Cameron supporting cunts. Cameron, do you remember him? He's like a big, cuddly fucking Mr. Blobby now, isn't he? If he walked into any of our fucking houses, we'd blow him. That's how bad things are. Anyway. Uh, uh, yeah. Delicious food served on the finest platters. While Brian says, Prince, do you like me? And David says, Prince, what is Sheena Easton really like? And Brian says, Prince, seriously, do you like me? And David says, Prince, can you play the guitar in real life? And Brian says, Prince, please like me. And David says, Prince, computer says no. And Prince says, I've told you 18 fucking times, I'm Lenny Kravitz, you're both racist. <laughs> Unforgettable. I am humbled humble at David's complete lack of humility. He, he wasn't alone in being the online corpse fucker the second the news broke of the tragic and untimely death of Michael Legg's Prince, but his words are the ones that have stayed with me the longest. I will look at his tweet every single day for the rest of my life because it said everything that I wanted to, but mainly because it's hilarious that Brian Ferry has still not acknowledged it. Fucking hell, I genuinely used to look at that tweet all the time to see if Brian, Brian Ferry had replied. He hadn't. My friend said that it is the single worst thing that anyone has ever posted on the internet. <laughs> An achievement in itself. But she is clearly jealous, petty and correct. David, just like I tried so hard to do, saw his opportunity and exploited it. And as any Prince fan knows, if Prince stood for anything, it was exploitation. Thanks everyone. Applause, 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 applause. Wow, how did that uh, not get into uh, Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle? <laughs> is, it, uh, is it too late to sneak that into Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle? I mean, has anyone really got to the end of Wolf Hall? Stick that blog in. It's fun, it'll really lighten the tone. There's a lot of um, 
murder in that uh, in that book. Thank you so much uh, for uh, wasting an actual hour of your short lives here with me tonight uh, at this book launch. I'm over the moon that there is still 13 copies left. So that means somehow this was worth doing. <laughs> I don't know how, but it was worth doing. 13 copies. Why not buy another copy? Because um, one, if you read it, uh, you might uh, like it and you might want to read it again. So you've got two copies, but also uh, you might read it once and not believe. And you might think the whole thing's a fucking typo. So get a second copy and you'll see that it isn't. It's actually meant to be like this. Um, I love you. Thank you very much to Chris from Go Faster Stripe. Thank you very much to Paul Litchfield from Nothing. I love him for that alone. <laughs> I hope to see you when Strawberries to Pigs 2 comes out tomorrow. I'm Michael. I love you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. 12 copies got to go. 12 fucking copies. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Lovely. <laughs>